let us fight for a new world, a decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Welcome to Rabble Rants. I'm Santiago Hello Quintero, and alongside Jesse McLean, we're going to unpack the stories that have us most riled up and challenge the narratives around them. We probably don't spend enough time going after conservatives on our show. Now, we go after conservative ideology. And I think, frankly, we're so exhausted and disillusioned with electoral politics altogether uh, that perhaps they don't come into the conversation quite enough. And although we cringe at the idea of simply voting for the NDP because they're the lesser evil and, you know, rah, rah, getting all really excited about mediocre things simply because it's better than the alternative, they really are the greater evil. There's some very unique things about conservatives and about Pierre Polyev that are exceptionally dangerous. And this isn't to tell you to vote how to vote. It's simply to highlight some of these really dangerous talking points being used, these really harmful approaches to politics that they lean on. And I think it it deserves to kind of be hyper aware of what they're up to because we talked about fascism on this show. And surely if a par- if there were one party to lead us down there faster... It would be the conservatives. And I think the one thing that really um, differentiates the two uh, conservatives from the liberals, we've we've talked enough about the NDP, is that the conservatives generally have their mask off for a lot of it. They have their populist mask on, right? They they will we'll talk about how they try to appear as populists on the campaign trail. But they have no problem taking the mask off when it comes to transgender rights, voting rights, housing solutions, scapegoating. Um, You can't even call them dog whistles anymore because dog whistle implies it's kind of subtlety, subtly, like most people can't hear it. Right. Humans can't hear it. Just dogs. But we all hear it. It's out there loud and proud, kind of full chest, as they say. And I think that's part of what makes him most dangerous on top of their economic policy. Yeah, I mean, look no further than Ontario uh, as an example here. I mean, Kathleen Wynne was not well liked. Uh, She was not a very popular premier. But Doug Ford has just been god fucking like, I mean, awful is not I, I don't have a word strong enough to describe what it's been like with Doug Ford. But I have like the amount of damage that he has done in Ontario, even an NDP majority wouldn't be able to undo um, everything he's done in for a very long time. Like it would take maybe over a decade, I don't know, to undo the damage that he's done. There needs to be room in politics to be able to have, you know, the nuance, the dialectics. To, to, to hold multiple things true at once, which is the liberals are fucking horrible. The conservatives are also fucking horrible, and but they are efficient at damaging things in a way that no one else is. The conservatives are a smooth operation. They are really, really, really good at what they do. And when they're in power... They get a lot done, and it's all bad. So what do we do with that? I want to get into, like, specifics of what they do, what they're tied to, and why it's dangerous. And the first item on my agenda there is the Christian nationalism. That's fucked up, that it's so obvious that they have ties to Christian nationalists, not just in photo ops, but events, and policies on um, policies like abortion that that is something the liberals would not dare take away 
And I know folks are like a lot of the things that we're going to talk about might not be economic. They might fall into the realm of identity politics for folks. But when you think of how many groups could be economically harmed thus by these social policies, surely you understand that this is a detriment to the working class as a whole, right? The rights on abortion and transgender rights. Like Amnesty International does not often have to issue statements warning against Canadian politicians, not even a leader. He's the leader of the Conservative Party, but he's not the leader of a country or a province. He made a pit stop in Kitchener, spoke for about 20 minutes and did so much harm in that one little stop. The way that he speaks of transgender people as dangerous saying that he will ban them from sports, from washrooms, from any kind of gendered space altogether, refers to them, and I apologize, as biological males. While speaking to the media and a large group of people, this was not just caught on camera. He is echoing the messaging as well that Danielle Smith, the Premier of Alberta, that they are going to limit medical access to transgender youth, specifically to medicines or surgeries that would be gender affirming. And they're incorrectly referring to a lot of these interventions as being permanent. It's a talking point they've both picked up and the media will not challenge them on it, even though that's incorrect. But they are nonetheless embedding this idea into uninformed people. <laughs> Most people, unless you are reading on trans rights or have a trans child, are not aware of what puberty blockers can or cannot do. One politician is going to get up and use their platform and say these lies, these unchecked lies that go beyond this one community, then they will stick and they will inform policy. And it all feeds into this politics of like anger and scapegoating that are just trademark uh, not just the Conservative Party, but Pierre Polyev, who his friends have nicknamed him the attack dog of the Conservative Party. So he is what you kind of call the worst. I know Maxim Bernier comes to mind as like the worst of the worst. But even he, like he leaves and he says it was became morally corrupt under the kind of libertarian conservatives that Pierre considers himself as. He models himself a lot after Harper. And it's really, really, really ugly politics. And it, it kind of ties it into that religious undertone of what Canadian families are. And that's 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 just absolutely detrimental. I call it a campaign stop because that's what they feel like. Surely everyone else is feeling this as well with the PharmaCare announcement that we are gearing up for something. And he goes on about international students and housing and reminds us that he will tie house the housing quotas to be built to the levels of immigration, like permanently making immigrants a scapegoat for housing. I mean, that shit is dangerous. Yeah, P Pierre Polyev is really uh, tuned in to the worst parts of public discourse right now. You know, whatever explanations people are throwing around for the problems of society, uh, you know, whatever scapegoating is going around, he's, he's in on it and he's repeating it and he is reaching audiences. And he's reaching young audiences is part of my fear. Young men in particular seem to really be, you know, agreeing with a lot of the things that Pierre Polyev is saying. He is, he doesn't have really any stances or principles. When you talk about career politicians, he's the absolute definition of a career politician. Like he's been in parliament for a very long time. Since 2004. 20 years. And he's a fairly young person, isn't he? He's the same age as me. But even before he was a member of parliament, all he he lived and breathed politics. He has wanted to be a politician. If you look at the stuff that he got up to in school, he took international relations. This was on his mind all the time. But I don't want you to fall into the trap that I've heard other people here. And I've probably repeated it. But as I'm digging up on Pierre, he has passed legislation. I don't know where that came from, but he 
introduced the Fair Elections Act. I believe that's like 2012. I, I might have my year wrong, but he absolutely did pass a piece of shit legislation. For a while, he was Harper's democracy guy. Shame on me for not knowing what the actual minister ministry is called, but he was in charge of Elections Canada and got into this pissing war with Elections Canada trying to remove rights from them. So just to give you an idea of where he stands on democracy, that bill, he wanted to remove the ability for people to vouch. Now, that's a real disenfranchisement. That's when, you know, you don't have any ID available, which often happens to unhoused people, people that have to move constantly. And he wanted to remove that ability. Most of the amendments that were made kind of cleaned it up a little bit, but he wanted to remove spending limits on some of the activities that political parties could do. But this one I thought was, was this one will be fun for anyone who's ever worked a campaign. He wanted to change the ability to appoint the poll supervisor to whoever won that the previous election. So not Elections Canada. So if the Conservatives or the Liberals won the election, they would get to pick the poll supervisor for the next election because there'd be nothing wrong with that. So the Fair Elections Act was actually anything but. So that's another thing that you can expect from the cons is an attempt to disenfranchise voters by any means necessary. I was going to say, I hate the Orwellian language used when naming uh, bills in parliament, you know, Fair Elections Act, when it's, you know, anything. But it's so often the case that they just, it, it feels so dystopian. Pierre Polyev is kind of almost, in a way, a perfect kryptonite, I think, for many people on the left, in the sense that he appears to be such a clown, you know, when he talks, it's like everything he said, like if you know what's going on, you see how disingenuous everything is. If you live politics, if you're if if this is what you do, you see through the bullshit. But most people are too busy with everything that's going on in their lives in the world and they don't pay attention to this stuff until it's election time or in the brief clips and the things he's saying resonate he's a very effective communicator he is way more dangerous than i think a lot of people give him credit for and it's shown i've been saying that for a while and it's reflecting right now in the polling numbers it is his election to lose and maybe he loses it because he's trying to get everybody to have to input their id in order to access porn and the conservatives aren't a fan of that like conservative voters aren't a fan of that because it's the opposite of you know libertarianism which is what many of them claim to want and maybe that costs him some points but really it's his election to lose it's his election to fuck up but he has it in the bag right now i think that's why it makes it so important for folks to remember just how awful he is He's the guy that when we were talking about residential school payments to survivors, and yeah, the liberals are pieces of shit. They fought that in court tooth and nail. But you know, do y'all remember what Pierre said about it? He looked at it and he says, I feel like we're not getting value for all of this money. He emphasized instead that we need to engender the values of hard work and independence and self-reliance into indigenous people. So this is his view openly of reconciliation. Now, he walked that back, but only because the backlash was so intense. He spoke exactly his truth the first time. It's a very capitalist viewpoint that everyone should be self-sufficient. He does label himself a libertarian, but like his populist statements, he is it is full of contradictions, too. When you were talking about being disingenuous, I couldn't help but think of the photoshopping that his team have been doing. And the latest one was just too much. I mean, they're adding the five o'clock shadow. Mm -hmm. They're chiseling his jaw and like he's bursting out of his T-shirt. <laughs> they're trying to do the Trudeau thing. I was going to say it was, it, it's very 
optical based politics, very surface level shit. Like you mentioned not being able to do the digging on the lie. Like the media should know better. If you're going to ask them about transgender questions, you should have some friggin' knowledge going into it or whatnot. But it's just a salesman's game. Right. But when you really look at the policies that he's tried to introduce over the years or the statements that he's made, incredibly troubling stuff. The liberals aren't that friendly to unions, but Pierre went on a mission. He is so against the Rand formula. There were a few years where he dedicated a lot of his efforts alongside Randy Hillier, Hillier, one of our other favorite Ontario conservatives, and they really did want right-to-work laws, which are really right-to-work for less laws. But what they would do is end mandatory union dues for folks that are working in the union, (laughs) working in that workplace. You could opt out of the union. And that is something that went throughout the United States. Very problematic legislations happen there. There, It's just an attack on workers. I need to emphasize how fucking dire of a moment we're living in right now. I mean... Let's just talk for a second, and I, I, this is something that I should be mentioning every episode, but, you know, the climate crisis. Please take a look outside your window. The trilliums are blossoming in Ontario in February. That is not okay. Now, the Conservatives control almost every single province. They gain a majority control federally. The damage that is being done to the world right now and and beyond like we can approach this from climate change from from global politics the state of the economy you know the state of essential goods whatever fucking angle you want to take it it is dark right now and if the conservatives win this majority which they're going to it seems like unless something seriously changes we're really fucked here we need to be prepared for an enormous fight And we're not ready for what's coming. It's dark. It is. And the conservatives won't really even acknowledge that there's a problem. I think eventually in the last election, they conceded that they do, in fact, believe in climate change, but not so much that it has anything to do with human activity. So that would be the starting point to which folks would be operating under And that's really hard, though, to push that up against the liberals to convince people that it would be any worse, because I think with the liberals, they might say that they believe in climate change and that human activity is responsible for it and that they even are committing to lowering the emissions. And then they do everything the opposite anyway. And I think that's why it's so difficult sometimes to convince people conservatives are worse is because the people who pretend to be a little bit better quite often end up with the same goddamn policies. But but surely you can say that someone who's not even willing to acknowledge there's like a real problem that they can do anything about and who has a really anti-globalist view uh, in terms of global cooperation in, in all sorts of means, that sets back the climate change movement immensely. Or it doesn't, right? When these folks get to power... Sometimes like 40 percent, I think, is what he's sitting at at the polls. It's looking like a conservative majority should should the trigger be pulled now. And that's terrifying for folks. And from our perspective, it really doesn't change. Just like Desmond Cole explained how when Olivia Chow won, it doesn't really change how you approach your politicians. One thing that we said about Trump is although, yeah, he is awful. He's awful for all like the same reasons we're kind of describing here. I think the rhetoric that goes around him and the, the toxicity of politics that go around him make it extra worse. But at least it's so obvious that he is the enemy when they're there. Because <laughs> when Biden's there and everyone's like, oh, give him a chance. And what else? Do you want Trump? Like they use that fear. And so... Surely, like when conservatives come to power, there should be nobody unwilling to go up against them hard, because if they win and when they win, I mean, the response is going to have to be enormous, bigger than anything we've seen so far, because you see how far you have to move them in terms of their ideology or pushing past what their base want, because at least liberals, they go into conventions 
and their base are telling them, hey, we want to decriminalize sex work. We want zero to cut our emissions down. We we want to get to net zero. And so they feel a little bit of pressure. Conservatives go into their conventions and all of this shit is actually reaffirmed to them or at least a bulk of it. And so the pressure entirely will have to come from unconventional means. You're going to hear an interview later this week with Ricardo Trangen, who wrote The Tenant Class. And I think it's apt to remind folks that uh, Pierre Poliev is not just a landlord in the sense that uh, Jagmeet (laughs) is and became after criticizing the housing crisis. Pierre Poliev and his wife, they are like big investors in rental properties. They own a real estate investment company. And then his wife, in turn, owns an additional rental property. So if you think at any point they would implement any kind of policies that would touch the pocketbooks of landlords, because one of the points that Ricardo makes that, you know, spoiler, is that there there can't be a win-win when it comes to addressing housing. There needs to be wealth removed from the landlord class in order for anything to happen. Continuing to put somebody in power that really does make their living off of buying up more and more rental properties. Please let that be a red flag to to folks that are struggling to pay rent because it's not just left wing people that are poor. <laughs> like you, you folks all hopefully realize that that's why populism plays so well with Pierre. He does stand up there and he says that he's going to go after the big guys. But none of the policies that he talks about or votes for are anything like that. Not one of them. You know, this is the piece of shit that voted against supplying school lunches while talking about hungry kids in Canada. They don't even attempt to have their voting or policy record match up with what they're saying on these campaign trails or whatever they're calling all of these stops all over the country. And the press don't don't challenge them on it either. That's so maddening. And I hate that we have to keep coming back to this over and over again. But if someone stands in front of you and says, I'm really concerned about kids that are hungry, how can you not respond, but you just voted against school lunches? Yeah. And and that Canada's the only G7 nation that doesn't have a school lunch program. What we're, what we're staring down here, a lot of people like to remain hopeful when it comes to politics that... You know, these great, horrible things cannot possibly be popular enough in society to make it through. When we know that that's not how this works. I mean, how many lessons do we have to watch? You know, people thought, oh, for sure, Trump will never beat uh, Hillary Clinton. But he did. Doug Ford couldn't possibly win a second term, but he did. Right now, with how unpopular Trudeau is with how unpopular the liberals are and with how misunderstood politics are and with how little of an actual legitimate media network in Canada that can challenge these powers, there is no reason to believe right now that anything but what is cert- what looks certain to happen is going to happen. And it's going to... Like, we need to start preparing for the fights that we're going to have to have. Because I, I'm not sure that we can prevent this election from being a victory. Because who, who exactly is the backed alternative? Is it the Liberals? Is it the NDP? Well, Pharmacare isn't going to save those two at this point. I don't think that that no. was a big enough announcement to undo the damage they've done. No, that, and that, and that's the thing. You know, we talk about, like, how, I, I mentioned how, like, the NDP should have burnt everything to the fucking ground. If they did, they would have had some respect. You know, they would have had people saying, "Okay, well, you know, they're willing to go to bat for us. They're willing to lose something for us. Right. But they didn't even do that. You can see that they're just in it to hold on to the power. Not even during a genocide, because there's so many points where we were like, well, you guys are going to say something about this, right? Like, you can't go along with this. You can't go along with that. But then, holy shit, it got to the point where not one MP... Not one MP decided to just sit down or stand up or, like, make an actual scene, like, take an actual physical stand 
Even if it seemed ridiculous and futile, it showed us that you were mad as hell and you weren't just going to be complicit and you weren't just going to get suckered into that system, that there was some fucking fight left in the people in there. But honestly, I think that was it. It was just for me, it was no. Like, for example, back in the day in, you know, in 2002, talks about the Iraq war, Bernie, who, you know, he's been failing us lately in all kinds of ways, but he, he filibustered for eight hours about the Iraq war. He tried his darndest to stop it. Or at least center that discussion. Show the urgency yeah. and the steadfastness. It, it was futile. He knew it was futile. It was not going to work. But he stood there and he took up as much time and as much space as he could to do everything in his power to stop it. We don't have anyone like that here. And Bernie, he's failed when it comes to... To talking about Palestine. You know, I'm not going to defend him. We don't have heroes here. But my point is that, like, how can, you know, we have a, a very large house of commons with 338, is it? Parliamentarians. And they all, n not one of them showed that kind of care. Not one of them. I don't know how they live with themselves. You know, because they've also failed us in so many ways in terms of keeping the conservatives down. Because they did not start off like this. I'm reading a Tai article that is valid, makes completely valid points. But in the end, I think even they will agree they were terribly wrong. It was written back in 2022 when Pierre was first elected the leader of the conservatives. And I think most people felt the same way. He looked really geeky. We hadn't heard a lot from him. His public speaking, frankly, wasn't even all that wonderful. And they wrote a pretty accurate article at the time that said that he'd probably tank the party. And they went over his awful history and his attitude in politics. They also revealed his nickname with, within political circles is Skippy. They were accurate in the way that they described how he would use hate and anger politics. I think here's the quote there. Skippy is tailor made for incision rage, using the tried and true method of putting a single face to all that is wrong with the country. And they're referring to his targeting of Trudeau, that feeding into that convoy narrative of fuck Trudeau, postering his image as you know, the Antichrist, essentially, and it puts everyone's focus not on capital, not on the policies that we need for change, but that if we could simply just remove Trudeau, everything would be fixed. And but they predicted that would not be successful, that that was not a lasting political strategy. And unfortunately, they've actually done a really good job of it. It's a mix. It's they have played that populism song quite clearly for folks while avoiding a lot of terrible missteps for their base. And at the same time, the NDP and the liberals have just given a shit. And that deal has hardly amounted to anything. And so it does absolutely look like we're in for a conservative majority what you're seeing is the Liberals and the NDP doing everything possible to see if they can stretch that out until 2025 and hope that the polls change. Because there are ways electoral politics can harm us. There's not, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of ways that they can fix the actual issues that we're facing. But there is surely legislation that can be introduced that can really, really hurt us. And the fight, again, will not be coming from inside the House. It will have to be, it will have to be us.